when I see people wearing an orange shirt or wearing an orange pin, what that means to me is that they are learning. Tonight, educating and promoting awareness about residential schools on Orange Shirt Day. Justice for Joyce! Justice for Joyce! A vigil is held in Joliet, Quebec in honor of Joyce Echequan. Well, that's because that's the only description we had. So if we don't have any other description, we... And Nunavut RCMP explain what happened in a case of mistaken identity. Good evening, I'm Brittany Hobson. We begin tonight in Quebec, where the personal and political fallout of Joyce, Joyce Echequan's death continues. Prior to, prior to her passing, the Atikamik woman's Facebook live stream of racist comments directed to her by hospital staff has shaken the province and has many looking for answers. Tom Fenario has more. Justice for Joyce! Justice for Joyce! This was the rallying cry at this vigil for Joyce Echequan in voices big and small. The chant was aimed at the hospital in which Echequan died after live streaming racist comments directed to her by nurses. Others here say they've also had bad experiences at this hospital in Joliet, about an hour north of Montreal. This Atikamik woman said she woke up mid-operation when her general aesthetic wore off and overheard her doctor. Je me suis réveillé, puis le gynécologue qui était là disait des choses dégradantes à propos des autochtones. Il disait que les autochtones étaient toute une gang d'alcooliques. Reports of Indigenous people in Quebec encountering racism in the healthcare system is nothing new. A year ago today, a Quebec inquiry into relations between public services and Indigenous people made several calls to action to combat racism. Indigenous Affairs Minister Sylvie Damol says despite delays caused by the pandemic, over a third of the calls are in various states of being addressed. AFN Quebec Regional Chief Gislain Picard says his organization has taken it upon themselves to address racism in Quebec society. They have created an action plan with dozens of recommendations for Quebec to use to immediately address racism against First Nations. On va pas euh, s'éterniser sur euh, ce que le gouvernement a fait ou n'a pas fait. Euh, je pense que c'est une perte d'énergie. On va surtout se concentrer sur ce que nous pensons qui doit être fait à partir de maintenant. Donc euh, le plan est davantage ciblé envers la population, euh, le plan que nous avons soumis. Et euh, je pense qu'il y a une responsabilité pour tout le monde. Aside from this vigil in Joliet, others were held all over Quebec for Joyce Echequan. Her family is grateful for the support, but is still coming to terms with their loss. Ma femme m'a laissé seul avec les enfants. C'est ce que parce qu'on s'était promis de se marier. Puis c'est tout cassé ça. In a press release, Minister Damol has expressed her condolences to the family. She also adds a nurse involved in the incident has been fired, while internal and external investigations are underway. But for Constant Awashish, the Grand Chief of the Atikamek Nation, it's not enough. He's demanding a public inquiry. And while the family is anxious to know more about how Joyce Echequan died, for her life partner, it's cold comfort. <laughs> Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Joliet, Quebec. Today is Orange Shirt Day, and September 30th means people around the world are asked to wear orange to raise awareness about residential schools and reconciliation. Daryl Stranger brings us this story. I think it's important for people to, you know, not just wear it on the 30th, but wear it any day you want. Like, start a conversation, learn something about someone's history that you might not know about. Orange Shirt Day is designed to educate people and promote awareness in Canada about the residential school system. Across Canada today, people commemorate the residential school experience and honour the healing journey of the survivors and their families. One of those survivors is Phyllis Webstead, whose personal story of having her new orange shirt, which was given to her by her grandmother, taken from her on her first day of school, inspired the orange theme. When I see people wearing an orange shirt or wearing an orange pin, what that 
means to me is that they are learning. They're taking the time to learn about what happened to us and that they have empathy for our and our family's experiences and that uh, they are committed to reconciliation and to making a difference um, and learning the history. September 30th was chosen as the date, as this is the time of year in which children were taken from their homes to residential schools. It's also an opportunity to promote anti-racism and anti-bullying policies for the coming school year. There are many designs of orange shirts, but one in particular, designed by artist Patrick Hunter in partnership with Rogers, has raised over $100,000 for the Orange Shirt Society. I wanted to do something that was pan-Indigenous, that kind of spoke to a lot of different, um, a lot of us. So, um, you know, the eagle is, is revered in our community, so I wanted to recognize him, but then also recognize that, you know, when someone gets an eagle feather, it means that you've done something that is, you know, significant to the community. And I think, you know, anyone that has gone through the residential school system undoubtedly deserves an eagle feather. And also for the ones that didn't make it through as well, like honoring their memory too. A new bill has also been tabled in the Canadian government to make September 30th a national statutory holiday. It would be in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action number 80, which called for a day that would honor survivors, their families, and communities. Webstat hopes if passed, people take advantage of the time off on that day. People that do get the day off of work and are paid, uh, I would hope that they wouldn't stay home and do laundry and catch up on yard work, that they go out to events that are being planned all across Canada and lend a hand. Daryl Stranger, APT National News, Winnipeg. Every Child Matters Reconciliation Through Education is an online event held virtually today by the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation. More than 500,000 students, teachers and members of the public registered for the event. The virtual event included two acts, the first on truth and the second on reconciliation. Rai Moran is the director of the NCTR and he joins us now. Rai, thank you for speaking with us today. Can you talk about the importance of continuing to share these stories and educate people on the residential school system? In the uh, program that we're sharing out with youth across the country right now, uh, Janet Longclaws from Long Plains says something very simple but very beautiful. These stories matter because survivors matter. And it's incredibly important that we honour residential school survivors, their experiences, their hopes, their dreams, through listening and continuing to listen. What do you hope the 500,000 or so people who took part in this event take away or learn from it? At another point in the program that we're sharing with people across the country today, um, Gord Downey actually of all people says that this is the first generation in Canadian history growing up with the full knowledge of what happened in the residential schools and hearing the call for reconciliation. That's exceptionally powerful. You know, kids are starting their lives now with the benefit of this knowledge. Um, we will continue to see the effects of them knowing this, them understanding this history for generations to come, and it will absolutely make for a more just and fair uh, country because you can't help but feel the need for the change when you listen to um, the survivors. The government has tabled a bill to make Orange Shirt Day a national stat holiday. What role did the centre play in that? Well, of course, we, we continue to support uh, all of the calls to action issued by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, that national day for Truth and Reconciliation was an important call to action issued by the TRC. Uh, we have appeared in front of committees. We've uh, attended with uh, survivors and others. We've talked to a lot of people. We've been generally trying to, to push that along because it's exceptionally important that we continue to anchor these national days of honoring and remembrance into our collective consciousness. It's very important that we gather each and every year uh, to continue this very hard work that lay ahead of us. So what is uh, next for the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation? 
Well, there's there's always uh, a lot of work um, that we have um, to do, but I really think that the step that we've taken here today by uh, providing really a lot of really great resources out to teachers is, is an incredibly important step. Um, these resources that are now in their hands will be something that they can can continue to use, can continue to go back to. And there's a, many questions that are raised. For example, you know, Wilton Littlechild, um, the former commissioner of the TRC, talks about the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. There's calls to action for that. There is legislation that we still need to see. Canadians need to understand how important that UN Declaration is to ensure that reconciliation continues and that the great injustices are, uh, are stopped. So there's a lot more dialogue that we have to have in this country. There's a lot more education, and the Centre is just so incredibly honoured to be a part of all of this. Well, thank you, Rai. I want to uh, thank again for your time and uh, really appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. And in Ottawa, no doubt because it's Orange Shirt Day, several issues of concern to Indigenous people cropped up during question period. In fact, Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole led off today's QP that way. Both the Conservatives and NDP pressed the Prime Minister over ending long-term boiled water advisories, saying there is no doubt the government can meet a saying there is doubt the government can meet a March 2021 deadline. As you can imagine, this has left many nations across Canada, including Minnesticwin in my riding and Bearskin Lake for First Nation in Northern Ontario, wondering whether indeed they are a priority for this government. My question for the Prime Minister is if not 2021, when will these long-term drinking water advisories actually be lifted? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. We are working extremely hard to reach that deadline. We've already eliminated uh, well over 80 of those long-term boil water advisories and are working very hard on the next ones. Uh, COVID challenges have brought a bit of a delay, but that is why we are further accelerating our efforts and working extremely hard not to meet some deadline, but to make sure that all Canadians have access to safe drinking water. Nunavut RCMP are in the hot seat after a case of mistaken identity goes awry. More on that after the break, but first a preview of another story coming up. I'm Priscilla Wolf, coming soon on AP10 National News. 200 alumni from the University of Saskatchewan signed a letter stating that the school has racist practices and it's hurting communities. They're going in a direction where, um, uh, you know, that lack of support is going to affect our public education systems across Saskatchewan because, of course, we're training teachers there. That story coming soon on AP10 National News. Here's Thursday's weather forecast beginning on the East Coast. Sunny skies in 21 in Charlottetown, 19 in Halifax, 17 above in Cartwright, 6 degrees in Nain, 15 in rain in Quebec City, 16 above in Montreal, cloudy skies for much of southern Ontario, 15 in London, 17 in Toronto, 6 above in Wawa, 10 degrees in Sudbury, in northern Manitoba, mix of sun and cloud and 7 in the Paw, 6 above in Norway House, some sun and an 8 degrees in Winnipeg, 9 above in Brandon and Dauphin, in Saskatchewan, some rain and 11 in Regina. Welcome back. Yesterday we brought you the story of a case of mistaken identity in Iqaluit, where four RCMP pulled out rifles on an innocent man. Today, Nunavut's head cop is with our Kent Driscoll to try and explain what happened. This from Iqaluit. This was the scene on Saturday, September 26th when a Kaluit RCMP incorrectly identified Ashivak Montague as the man they were looking for. He matched the description, camo jacket and a rifle. In a Kaluit, that's nothing unusual. That's a common outfit. We asked Nunavut's head RCMP officer, Chief Superintendent Amanda Jones, why provide such a vague description? Well, that's because that's the only description we had. So if we don't have any other description, we can't provide that. So that's what the members are, have to go on, and that's what they end up releasing, right? So Montague fit the description, so he had four carbine rifles pointed at him. Nunavut's justice minister wants the police to consider where they are working. 
I was saddened to hear that, that this had happened. Um, I think the RCMP should take into consideration that um, you're in the north. You're going to see people walking around with guns. This photo, taken by Montague's mother during the arrest, shows high-powered carbine rifles. We wanted to know, when do the RCMP get those out instead of their sidearm? If you have immediate danger to public and self, somebody else with a, a firearm, so that would be the case where you have someone with a firearm, we're not sure what type of firearm they have. It could be uh, you know, a full pile rifle or it could be a 22, right? So in order to, to meet that, then um, they would bring out their carbines. Now in this photo, Montague is on the ground, hands behind his head. Instead of pointing their carbine rifles to the ground, they're still trained on Montague. When do you point the rifle away? Well, when you have the person secured. So just because somebody's on the ground and their hand behind their head doesn't mean they're secure, right? They can easily jump up. They might have something in their, their pockets. So we haven't searched them yet. We don't know if there's, a, there's another gun somewhere or a knife or anything. So until it's just officer safety, public safety. So until that person's hands are behind their backs and in handcuffs, then everything is, is taken down to another level. Things did go down another level. The RCMP agree. Montague did everything he was asked to. But why was he there in the first place? Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Halloween. In Winnipeg, James Fable is back on board with the Winnipeg chapter of the Bear Clan Patrol, this time as a member of the volunteer organization's board of directors. Fable was fired as the paid executive director earlier this year, officially over a complaint leveled by a co-worker. He was later reinstated as a regular, a regular member of the Community Street Patrol. That opened the door for Fable to run for the board. He was elected as a new board member Tuesday evening with 73 votes. Fable helped revive the patrol in 2014, soon after the body of Tina Fontaine was recovered by police from the Red River. In Saskatoon now, over 200 alumni from the University of Saskatchewan sent an open letter to the school stating the administration has a big problem with racism. Priscilla Wolf has a story. Sheila McLean has a PhD in anti-racism and was one of over 200 University of Saskatchewan alumni that signed a 15-page open letter released over social media to the University of Saskatchewan. The letter addresses their concerns about racism and states nine Indigenous faculty and senior staff left in frustration. And we know that many people over the last two and three years have made formal complaints to the University of Saskatchewan about the toxic environment, about the lack of support, but nothing's been done. McLean says their main concern is with the College of Education and its administration mainly because they are training Saskatchewan's future teachers. They're going in a direction where, um, uh, you know, that lack of support is going to affect our public education systems across Saskatchewan because, of course, we're training teachers there. One of the Indigenous staff that left was former professor and former chair of Indigenous education, Jeff Baker. He resigned because he felt the environment was toxic and he didn't feel his work was being supported. Baker also signed the letter and feels that the College of Education at the University of Saskatchewan needs to do better in supporting Indigenous staff and teachings. This is really about our public education system and this is the institution that trains, you know, teachers that are going to be shaping our society in Saskatchewan and Canada. Um, for, for years and generations to come. McLean says since the letter has been released, the university is reviewing the long list of complaints. My understanding is that um, there is going to be a review, that they are going to do an internal investigation regarding all of the complaints that have come forward and regarding the open letter. APTN contacted the University of Saskatchewan for a comment. They released this statement. We acknowledge that ongoing conversations will be necessary and we need to ensure all voices are heard in the coming weeks. Meetings will be scheduled to include all faculty, staff and administration within the college. Priscilla Wolf, AP10 National News, Saskatoon. Coming up, we take a look at the new season of In Focus ahead of its launch next week. But first, here's our White Horse correspondent, Sarah Connors, to tell us about a story she'll be bringing us. 
today I'm working on a story about an indigenous business owner in the Yukon who's joined forces with 20 other female-owned indigenous businesses and entrepreneurs and they're calling on major Canadian retailers to devote 15 percent of their shelf space to indigenous owned businesses. So this pledge was inspired by a pledge in the U.S. which was sparked by the death of George Floyd. And this pledge called on major retailers in the U.S. to devote some of their shelf space to businesses that were owned by black, indigenous, and people of color. Canada has a terrible track record of indigenous representation in the retail space. Uh, for instance, Hudson's Bay Company, which carries about 1,800 brands, only one is indigenous owned. And other major retailers like Holt Renfrew, Simons, and this one right here, they don't carry any. So we'll have more for you on that story coming soon on APTN National News. Here's the rest of Thursday's weather forecast picking back up in northern Alberta. 10 degrees and rain in Fort McMurray, 20 above in Grand Prairie, 22 with a mix of sun and cloud in Calgary, 17 in Medicine Hat, over to the west coast, 22 degrees in Kamloops, 19 above in Vancouver, 19 with a mix of sun and cloud in Smithers, 14 degrees in Dees Lake, in the Yukon, sunny skies and 15 for Watson Lake and Whitehorse. Over to the NWT, 18 degrees in Trout Lake, a mix of sun and cloud and 8 above in Yellowknife. 8 degrees in Colville Lake, 7 and rain in Fort McPherson. In Nunavut, 2 degrees in Chesterfield, 2 degrees in Arviat. 0 degrees in Iqaluit and 0 in King Knight. Focus returns with a brand new season next week. Host Melissa Ridgen and producer Beverly Andrews kicks things off with a look at the second wave of COVID. How are communities coping as the second wave of COVID-19 hits? Many communities are experiencing cases for the first time after months of keeping the virus out. What's in store as we enter cold and flu season? Coughs, fevers and sneezes will certainly cause more concerns than usual. In Focus has a doctor to weigh in on how to cope and what is the mental health toll on all of this all of this is taking. Tune in next Wednesday, October 7th at 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central, or watch live on the EPTN News Facebook page. Also returning next week is Face to Face with Dennis Ward and Nation to Nation with Todd Lamarand. That's all your APTN National News for this Orange Shirt Day. If you missed the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation's virtual event earlier today, you can go view it again on our Facebook page at APTN News. I'm Brittany Hobson. Take care and have a good night.